look, there's, there's, there's a very fundamental thing to understand about history that a lot of people don't. It's a human creation. It's as much a human creation as a piece of art. History is not the past. History is our thinking about the past and remembering the past. That's what it is. And therefore, and also we are fundamentally visual creatures. You know, we invent language. We invent alphabets. But we don't invent the human eye. And that's why the eye will always beat the blip, 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 because this is, uh, this is the creator's creation. To have these things that we can see, they remind us of yesterday. Going back to what I said, history is not the path. You know, William Faulkner made that point, the great author of Mississippi and the South. Also, there's nothing more fundamental to a culture than the basic narrative that underscored all that we live by. So the preservation of these things, especially when you have so many people who are moving into Men Hill who have no, they have no memory. To them it's just, you know, going to Walmart, you know, or it's going to Target. Where's the closest Target? So you've got to have those things that give that texture. I've often said, people who live with no historical perspective are like people who live in a room with no witness. With the exception of Philadelphia Presbyterian Church, no other institution in Mint Hill is more historic or has served the community longer. For over 134 continuous years, the school has provided an excellent education for the students of the area. Prior to the establishment of the school in 1889, early families hired private tutors and sent their children to local churches where they learned reading, writing, and arithmetic. In 1812, Rocky River Presbyterian Church and Philadelphia Presbyterian Church combined their resources to establish Rocky River Academy a college preparatory school in the Allen community. During its short history, which ended in 1824, the academy produced 25 ministers. Robert Hall Morrison, a graduate, became the first president of Davidson College when it opened in 1836. After closing, Rocky River Academy relocated to Harrisburg, which proved to be too far away for Mint Hill students. Members of Philadelphia Church dreamed about building a new academy for more than 65 years. Focused on survival during the Civil War and Reconstruction, with having no one willing to take on the task, building a new academy remained a dream. During the 1880s, a bachelor named John Bain, who was orphaned at an early age and reared by his older siblings, inherited the 700-acre family farm off of Lawyers Road. And though he did not have a good education, he realized its importance. When he approached the leaders of Philadelphia Church about building an academy, they accepted the idea without hesitation. Bain built in 1889. Bain paid $2,800 out of his inheritance to build a two-story brick school on land across the road from the church. The academy opened in 1889 and held its first commencement the following year. Nothing before or since had happened so quickly, wrote Russell Martin Carr in his book, The Gathering on Clear Creek. Built of handmade bricks, Bain Academy was two stories high and had five classrooms, three downstairs, two upstairs that were connected with stairs. It featured a wide porch downstairs and a balcony on the second floor trimmed in wrought iron. The roof was topped with a distinctive belfry that housed a cast iron school bell which called students to class. The building had no heat or plumbing, so students had to build fires and carry water. John Bain was a frequent visitor to the academy for the remainder of his life. According to one newspaper account, Mr. Bain delighted in listening to the little folks songs and the big folks debates and recitations. He was happy to carry his gold-headed cane, a gift 
from the Philadelphia Church members. On March 26, 1897, John Thane died at the age of 88. His passing was noted in the Charlotte newspapers, and he received many accolades for his contributions to the community, including the following. If Mr. Bain could come back and see the development which has been made and know all the good that has come through the influence of the school, his cup of happiness would overflow and he would consider the founding of Bain Academy was the best investment he had ever made. The school was more lasting than one of bronze or marble. May others follow his noble example and leave their name as a living memorial for generations to come. For many years, Philadelphia Church ladies decorated John Bain's grave with wreaths of cherry blossoms on the anniversary of his death. Mr. Bain is buried in the West Cemetery across the site from the Bain Academy. An obelisk monument bears this inscription. John Bain, the builder of Bain Academy, donated to Philadelphia Church, 1889. Long may his name live. The Bain Trust was established following John Bain's death. Funds were used to rebuild the school after a devastating fire in 1903. This trust also paid for the addition of four classrooms, including a science lab, a library, land for a playground, a gymnasium, an agriculture building, and teacher supplements. The grand total came to over $16,000. After the church turned the school over to Mecklenburg County in 1924, Charlotte architect Louis Asbury, the first North Carolinian to be admitted to the American Institute of Architects, was hired to redesign the school. The result was a handsome two-story brick building topped with the belfry from the original building. Credited with designing other schools as well as commercial and residential buildings, Asbury was known for his award-winning designs, including Mars Park Methodist Church, Mecklenburg County Courthouse, and the Montaldo's building in Charlotte. Bain Academy flourished from the start. In addition to serving local families, the school attracted a number of boarding students who lived with local families and paid an additional fee. Students who did not adhere to the strict discipline of the school were punished. The school offered a well-rounded curriculum that included physics, rhetoric, oratory, music, and Latin, not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Spelling bees, debates, and recitations attracted the visitors to the school. According to a 1910 promotional pamphlet, all of the teachers were college graduates and had teacher training with several years of experience, a standard that was not adopted by the county or the state for many years. The first graded school in Mecklenburg County Bain Academy served students from first grade through high school. For many years, it was one of only two schools in the county that prepared students for any college or university in North Carolina, the other being the school in Huntersville. The school was not only known for its academics, but also for its championship basketball teams, both boys and girls, and its cultural events, such as theatrical presentations, music recitals, and such. Its graduates became doctors, lawyers, ministers, teachers, government officials, merchants, bookkeepers, stenographers, tradesmen, craftsmen, farmers, and homemakers. Throughout the years, there have been many Bain reunions. The graduates of Bain Academy, later called Bain High School, loved their alma mater and the lifelong friends they met at the academy. The first school reunions were small, but grew larger and larger with each passing year. Sometimes reunions attracted politicians and were noted in the Charlotte newspapers. North Carolina Governor Clyde Hoey was the keynote speaker at the 1938 reunion. Bain alumni still keep in touch with each other and hold reunions from time to time, even to this day. There had been major changes throughout time. Students in grades 10 through 12 were transferred to the new East Mecklenburg High School in 1950, and Bain served students in grades one through nine only. And then when Northeast Junior High School opened in 1970, Bain became a one through five school. 
With the addition of kindergarten classes in 1976, it began serving K-5 through students. As the school grew, space in the existing buildings, including the building that housed the auditorium, were reconfigured to accommodate classes. Art and music classes were held on the old stage, where operettas and piano recitals had been given in the old days. The building was vacated after a brand new K-5 school opened in 2013 and its fate at that time was much debated. The idea of restoring and repurposing what had remained of the historic Bain Academy circulated for years, but it became the objective of a small group who believed the restoration and organized a movement to save the building. Led by Tina Ross, a Mid-Hill Commissioner, the group's first fundraiser was Bain Days, held at the Veterans Park in 2013 followed by a series of attic sales, a special Christmas play, and other events to raise funds. Though these events were successful, they never produced enough money to restore the building. Historic Bain Restoration also discussed restoration options with Preserve North Carolina, a group that saves and repurposes historic structures throughout the state. Working with Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Landmarks Commission was not even considered since the town of Mint Hill is not affiliated with the organization. In 2018, the town of Mint Hill invited the preservation group to support a $2.5 million public facility bond referendum to restore Bain School and an $18 million bond for a new athletic entertainment venue. Historic Bain Restoration used some of its funds to publicize and promote the passage of the bonds. The vote was held on November 6, 2018 with 5,085 yes votes and 5,625 no votes, a difference of 560 votes. After the bond referendum failed, the group continued to meet the following year and held discussions with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools about saving the school. In this fall of 2020, the building was demolished along with the dream of a restored Bain Academy. The group decided to use a portion of the remaining funds in the Historic Bain Restoration account to build a lasting memorial to Historic Bain Academy. The group hired Stephen Pinckney, AIA, a member of Preservation Mecklenburg Incorporated, to design a monument that would reflect the history and spirit of Bain Academy and would serve as a memorial to John Bain and all of the people who believed in his dream. I was driving back and I was thinking, what would be the appropriate setting, what would be the appropriate design for a monument to a school? But also to a person that envisioned uh, education as a tool to advance society. But when I got home and I was uh, sat at my desk, I saw an open book on my desk. It was a history book, as it happened to be. And uh, I saw the book in profile, and I saw this V form. And I thought, you know, a book can represent education in a school very, very well. And I liked that V form. And that was the inspiration for, for the monument. Wow. Then uh, additional excitement came in when I got to visit some of the artifacts that were saved from the school and were preserved at uh, Presbyterian uh, uh, Philadelphia oh. Presbyterian Church. And so uh, one, I was told that the old brick from the school was preserved. Uh, there was a keystone, which is, of course, on the right here. And also uh, the bell from the school was preserved, and it was beautiful. It looked just like a smaller version of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. And so I thought it would be so nice if we could incorporate the artifacts. And it was interesting because at that time I said, well, the church would never give out the bell, but we'll talk to them. And uh, the wonderful thing was that there were several people on the committee that can be quite persuasive. And I remember when I received the notice, yeah, they're going to give us the bell. And so we're able to incorporate a lot of these artifacts into the monument. And it, the tribute to uh, John Bain, whose portrait is on the right, uh, who was the original benefactor of the school. But also we found uh, drawings and photographs of the old school 
And I thought it would be nice to have an image of that. And so we put place uh, two plots, one of John Bay and one of, uh, of the school the way it was in its original state. And that was a great experience. Um, it's uh, something unusual for an architect to work on. Huntley Brothers of Mint Hill was chosen as the contractor. Discussions were held on the placement of the monument. The CMS was willing to have the monument on the Asheville side of the school. Philadelphia property seemed to be a better choice since the church could oversee it indefinitely. Designed for easy maintenance, the monument features handmade bricks from the old school set in a pattern that represents an open book. The 1924 cornerstone and a bronze plaque honoring John Bain are located on the left panel. A bronze plaque with an image of the school, as designed by Lewis Asbury in 1924, is located on the right side. Philadelphia Church, which had stored the original bell in its historical room for many years, agreed for it to be securely mounted on top of the right panel. A circular pad of concrete faced with brick that matches the monument forms the base of the monument. The historic Bain Academy will remain in the memories of residents of Men Hill now for generations to come. A culture is based on stories. Every culture is based on stories. Look how many people today really do ground their lives on the Old Testament and as far as Christians are concerned, the New Testament. Look how many people in the Middle East base their lives on the prophet Muhammad and on the Torah. You could go on and on. They're stories. And those stories are celebrated and they're remembered. And that's what gives people guideposts in life. Going through life with no historical perspective is like being a billiard ball going from one side of the table to the other. You have no sense of where, where am I? Because part of where are you is time. We're all parts of a chain. We're all parts of a chain. And therefore, monument comes from memory. Monument is a visual element that reminds us of the stories of the past. And this one reminds us of a story of a critical institution in the past of Men Hill. And therefore, it's not superfluous, it's not, it's not trivial. It is crucially important. And I would say the real test of this monument is try to think of every way you can to get particularly young people those ones that move here from Pennsylvania or New Jersey or Illinois to come and stand in front of this monument. And the kids that are in that school right there, I mean, they could walk over here. You can have programs to bring them over here because once you ground a young child in that sense of stories from the past that this monument will do, you have a very different kind of person you have a different, very different kind of perspective on life. So what we in the historic preservation business are doing is so fundamental that mo most people don't even know it's important. As Dr. Morrill said, a culture is based on stories. Well, now you know the story about Bain Academy and the impact it had on Mint Hill. To close, here are some stories from two of Bain's longtime graduates. First contact I had with Bain School, and this was in 1938. Mr. Quillen was ag teacher then, before World War II. And he put on a little community fair. We had two mayors that had colds in May of that year. And
and they were the cutest thing from fair time. And uh, we heard that Bain School was going to have a fair. And we brought our coats to Mr. Quillen's fair and won first and second prize, two bags of sweet feet. And uh, I thought a lot of Bain from that time on. <laughs> Little things like that register with you. I'm Ramel Henderson Goodman, and I graduated from Bain High School in 1942. I, when I started the school, it was during the Depression, and everybody was poor and having a hard time. I walked to school because we uh, were about a fourth of a mile from the school. No, if you, they can, boys smoked in the basement, you got expelled. I came in from the playground too early, and the boys got into the room and locked all the doors and windows, and they couldn't get back in. So everybody that was inside got a spanking. The girls wore dresses. They didn't start wearing pants until probably after the war started. And the boys, most of them wore overalls. And uh, our dresses were made out of feed sacks, but they were pretty. They had prints on them. A flower sack or chicken feed sacks. Most of the time I went home for lunch, but there was no cafeteria. Everybody brought their own lunch. I remember Miss Keesler, Miss Lemon, Miss McManus, and my daughter and I had Ms. Lemon as teachers. Oh, well, she taught there for years and years. Her name was Miss Le Minnie Lemon. <laughs>